Hey there, it's Tuesday, October 17th, 2023, I think. Yeah, and I'm here. I'm still dying out loud. I'm Dave, your host, Dave Warnock. Glad to have you with us here on Dying Out Loud on the line. My voice is a little gravelly tonight, which I don't have a good explanation for, other than sometimes I think ALS just does that. It chooses to make my voice sound froggy, but I'll get through it. With your patience, thanks. Uh, I, I get every time I miss a week, and I apologize last week I'm, I missed. I hate missing, and every time I do, though, <clears throat> I get messages from uh, supporters and fans and others who are, "Are you okay? Oh, everything okay?" Um, yes, I'm okay. Um, I'm not dead yet. I'm still dying out loud, but ALS has challenges associated with it. Logistical, um, more and more needs that are arising for me caregiving uh, issues that I have to deal with. So sometimes it's not just being sick with ALS that might knock me out a week. It's just the logistical challenges of getting from point A to point B and how I navigate life with this thing. So I do appreciate everyone understanding that and your patience when it comes to that. There will be times when I just can't make the show. And we're, we're making plans on the line to have backups available. We always have backups, but I'm talking about on, on a more regular basis, but that's in the works coming up. And, um, but I'm glad to be here tonight. Uh, we are a call-in show. I want to remind you 720-619-2288. Would love to hear you, from you on any subject that's on your mind. If you're in the chat uh, and talking about stuff there, just come on in, give us a call. We'll, we'll talk to you about anything. And in that regard, I've got a uh, wonderful guest host tonight, uh, my good dear friend, Seth Andrews, the thinking atheist himself. Well, that's no, your don't say that. You know that. I know. I messed know it that's up. Wrong. I'm sorry. I know. You know that. Um, <laughs> I host the thinking atheist, but Dave knows that whenever people often will make that mistake, and I'm always throwing myself out going, oh my God, I am not a great thinker. But I'm really kind of thick. I'm really kind of thick and slow, but I can well, be why taught. Why did you name your channel The Thinking Atheist if you're not a thinking because atheist? Because I come out of a faith culture, Dave, and so did you, right? Where they taught us not to trust our brains, right? Trust not in your own understanding. Uh, not. The Lord works in mysterious ways. Who am right. I to know the mind of God? And so once I escaped, I decided let's create a community that celebrates thinking and you already know the answer, damn it. You just like to hear me say it. By the way, I love your voice right now. Okay. I think it's that's, kind a, of that low that's sexy a good sound for you. Thing. That's it's a, a it's very, a it's a good sound. But it's, I'll, it's I'll, an honor to be, uh, to be able to hang out. And I appreciate the invite, my friend. And I'll, I'll do my always. best to carry my weight, okay? Oh, you'll carry more than your weight. You always do. I've, I've enjoyed the last couple of years. You and I have been on several shows together. But more than that, we've gotten the chance to be 
live together at conferences and, and sharing the platform. And almost inevitably, we end up with our tables next to each other. And yeah. I watched the long line of people come getting their books signed by Seth Andrews. And then every now and then, one or two of them filter over to my table. And I, That is I, not true. <laughs> that is not true. You know, what's funny, though, is Dave and I will be at a convention and we're tabling and and which is as, as much as anything, a chance to connect with people and have yeah. conversations. So I That's look it. over and Phil Ferguson from the Phil Ferguson show who does skeptic skeptical money or whatever, mm -hmm. he comes over and he puts bus his business cards inside all of my books for sale without telling me. And then he walks away. So as people like are now coming good. through, all of a sudden it's like, wow, look, it's the Phil Ferguson show. And I'm like, that sneaky bastard. So he's I don't just know, giving him a handy bookmark. He's giving just him a handy bookmark. Check your books when you're there. But I, uh, so what I do know about you, Seth, is that um, you do a, you create a talk that you give at the conferences for the year, and then you retire it and put it on your channel. Last year it was, or this year, was the Purity Culture talk. Um, can you give our millions of viewers tonight a preview of what's coming up next from the mind yeah. of Seth Andrews? It's funny. Some people will say, well, what do you have down the pipeline? And sometimes I don't have an answer. It's probably like being a, a, a songwriter or an artist of some kind. And not that I'm a great artist, but you're waiting for inspiration. And mm -hmm. then you'll see a headline or you'll have a conversation or there will be a moment or a memory will, will hit you and you'll be like, oh, wait a minute. And yeah. so the purity culture speech was a lot like that. You and I both came out of that uh, very restrictive, kind of a shame-based thing mm -hmm. where, yes, you have natural impulses, but they are evidence that you were born a sinner and this is Satan who is, you know, he's stimulating your loins, cross your legs and be pure. And <laughs> they especially went after a when after females, right? I mean, yeah. men, uh, young boys and men are, are victims of purity culture, but they really went after the women because, of course, females are supposed to be the gatekeepers of sexual uh, uh, sanctity. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I did that, uh, that speech, which just went out. It's called God Likes to Watch. Yeah. And the one I'm, I'm, I just gave it in Wichita. I may be in Springfield next month, and I'm going to probably hang on to it and not put it online, but, but do it live a few other times or in early 2023 is called Seth Andrews versus God. Who is the better intelligent designer? Because yeah. I'm sick and freaking tired of people telling me that one of the proofs for God is that we are so amazingly designed. It is just, it's at, we're fine tuned. It's remarkable. Right. Right. And a cursory look is like, well, wait a minute, I think I could do better here, and this makes no sense, and this is destructive, and this is wasteful, this is just stupid, this is cruel. And so mm -hmm. I go through example after example, and it's a really fun speech, I have a lot of humor in it, and it will eventually in 2024 go out onto YouTube. But yeah, I'm going face to face, I'm, it's a Thunderdome, it's me and God, mano e mano, to see who can design the best. And uh, I'm not trying to sound arrogant, but I would put your bets on the heathen. Okay. Bet on the <laughs> infidel because I think I got this one locked up. Okay. I love it. That sounds great. Well, I yep. hope to get out this next year to do some, some uh, in-person events. And so hopefully we'll be able to, not this year, next year. I'm done this year for sure. I mean, but, how's um, travel wearing on you? I mean, you're out. I feel like you're out almost as much as I am. Hell, I'm able-bodied. And I'm still bitching about the time and the and the drain and my legs and the airports. And I look at you and I think, what do I have to complain about? So, I mean, how are you doing? It's, uh, yeah, traveling is getting more and more difficult, uh, obviously, with my physical limitations and, uh, again, all the challenges lo logistically. So I really do have to measure, and I'm really going to next year, measure what's the best use of my time and energy and the limited strength I have left? And is it the best use to get, you know, to travel across the country to speak at a conference to several hundred people, which I love doing. And you know that, and then connecting with them at a table and just interacting with them at a conference. I just do really love that, but man, it takes a toll. There's Whereas something special about it though. Here. I mean, you know yeah. what I'm talking about. Like when we were oh, yeah. in COVID and everybody was doing Zoom conferences by necessity, and I think they're amazing. 
Uh, yeah. But there was nothing like the dynamic of having that sort of symbiosis with the audience, having that instant Absolutely. ping back when you're talking about something, meeting people. And honestly, if you're speaking and it's the kind of thing where, you know, I'd like the speech to be able to go out. If I've got my gear there, just tell me, I'll record the speech, give it to you, and you can post it on your channel. So that way you get the best of both worlds. So well, that'd be, if your people yeah, call my great. people. Okay. I know, man. I love it. Thank you. I huh? The problem is, as you know, is I have no, I, I don't prepare anything. And so I never know what we're going to get. So it's going to, it's going to be what it is. <laughs> what is that it, like? I, it may be. I don't know why I do it that way, but I do. Massaging graphics and Warnock just goes up and the magic just freaking happens. What's that about? It's the I mean, Holy Spirit. Because you used to be a preacher. It's right? the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's that. Maybe I'm, and I'm being serious though. Maybe the, maybe you are the type of communicator that you can go up there and sort of know in the moment what the audience needs or where your mind space is at and you can just do it. Is that I right? do that. Yeah, I do think through what I want to say, like the night before and that day, I do have in my mind the things I want to touch on, but I don't have it like prepared in order. And there's a chance I'll miss something or bounce from one thing to the to the wrong thing. But I, I usually have enough of a sense of the things I want to touch on that I'm I'm able to to pull it back back in and and bring it. And I have several main points that I just want to drive home. Then it's not complicated. It's, it's, mine's a simple message, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I I'd love about that. You. Whenever I've got, you know, I get off the tennis court and I feel my arthritic knees and I just start to whine and feel sorry for myself about, uh, I literally think uh, Dave's out there and he's traveling the world and he is being positive and he is, you know, and he's got ALS. I mean, I know it sounds trite and cliche, but I really do. I think, what am I griping about? And Natalie and I will have those conversations about sort of recentering our focus and going, God, our, our life is, is here and here and here. And yes, everybody's got struggles, but to watch you has really helped to recenter us, to keep us sort of, um, you know, momentum wise kicking forward. And I know it sounds like a Hallmark movie, but I genuinely do mean that. And I appreciate it. I thank you for saying that. I, yeah. I do, I do appreciate when, when you say that or anyone says that what I'm doing is helping them it focus does. or center or whatever, because it's really why I do it. I don't, you know, like I said earlier, I do love going out and being with the people, but it, it's, it's really a, a, a drain physically and, and, it's easier to sit here in front of a computer screen and actually talk to more people um, and not have to do all that physical, the physically challenging stuff, but it's not the same reward, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep doing that as much as I can. So thanks, man. Yeah. And maybe we'll see you at the next one. Okay. Let's, let's talk to somebody besides you and me. What do you think? Yeah, I'm all yours. Whatever you need. Okay. Let's talk to Fawn. She, him in New York. Fawn, did I say your name yeah. right? You're on with Dave and Seth. Cool. How are you guys doing tonight? Very good, well. Good. Thanks for thanks for holding there. I appreciate you calling. What can we do for you tonight? Yeah, uh, I was wondering, my question is, uh, how can one uh, seek to use evidence or find ways to use evidence as a tool for better epistemological uh, ways to come up with truth as opposed to imagination and romance. Okay. Yeah, it says you are an atheist and you are deconstructing, so you're looking for better ways to form your epistemological ideas rather than what you were used to as a believer. Is that kind of accurate? Yes. Okay. Well, Seth, you've been doing this longer than me. What would you say to that? Well, I, um, I kind of get the vibe that Fawn already knows the answer to the question. Not that I, I feel like you already sort of, you, you have an intuition about this already and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's funny when you come out of a culture of belief in belief, we do become a little bit distrustful about the way forward. Like, how do I know what I yeah. know? Mm -hmm. And how, you know, uh, how do I know that this evidence is right and that evidence, quote unquote, evidence is wrong and those types of things. And I think in that type of journey, the perfect is the enemy of the good. 
You know, we're going to find flaws in the scientific process. We're going to have people involved, the human element and whatnot. But for me, the one thing that has been helping me most recently, the most effectively, is understanding identity beliefs. So when I am presented with a truth claim, or I'm thinking of something that I've always believed, I'm now having to stop in my tracks and say, is this an identity belief? Is it something that I've, mm. that is attached somehow to me emotionally, that I then care enough about it to defend, that it would bother right. me if it wasn't true? And I'm surprised at how many of those things, even about trivial stuff, you know, I, I was uh, sharing a statistic the other day, this is not about religion, but you know, that there's no evidence that sugar makes children hyperactive active and this is a long held mm. belief and mm. i say that out loud and i'm like well no cal i've seen kids on sugar they're crazy they're all over the place they're tearing the wallpaper down it's insane i've seen it but did i did i know what i was talking about when somebody talks about um you know other things in their lives video games cause violent behavior yeah they got play guns in their hands or killing people on the screen yeah that's right you know we've got to do something about that there are all these identity beliefs out there that we take personally. And, and the biggest help that I have had is to stop and say, am I taking this belief personally and why? And then sort of reverse engineering that to say, well, let's start with the information instead of how I feel about the, the subject. There's a, a website and a Facebook page and a, a Twitter page. I don't call it X on principle, but it's called Thinking is Power. I would send you there. They have some wonderful resources about sort of, uh, you know, separating the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, and right. being able right. to, to, you know, carry through a lot of the, the detritus and get into the meat, you know, it's a bad metaphor. Yeah. One, one thing you say about, you know, you brought up the term and word identity, and that is so core to my deconstructing process, you know, and one thing I recently realized is that. Uh, based on, and this is also, you know, based on my question here is like that my, my whole epistemological method for truth or to find truth has been romance and imagination, you know, and I'm not seeing those as beneficial anymore. And like, those have been the core of my identity though. And like, I hearken back to Shakespeare and, Pol you know, Polonius with his son when he said, above all else to thine own self be true. You know, well, and if I'm I may, my, are my beliefs that true to me, or that old, or that inspiring to me that I would believe them in the face of their falsehood? I, I think it's a myth that we can divorce emotion from reasoning things out. It's okay to feel things about the things we think about. And I was talking to David McRaney, who has a great book called How Minds Change, and he asserted that it's impossible. For you to develop an opinion without emotion being involved and i think mm -hmm. those of us who have been manipulated by the church emotionally tend to we, we want to be vulcans and say well you know i've been manipulated once now it's two plus two equals four and it's all data and it's all logic and i don't think that i don't think we are wired that way mm -hmm. but i think in our case we say the emotions don't lead the train and being aware of how we respond emotionally allows us to begin to use it as a tool, to, you know, understanding our response, our actions and reactions when it comes to truth claims out there. Uh, you know, I'm not yeah. Yoda on this stuff, but uh, understanding how beliefs are attached to identity. You know, we see this in the political process when we go and we, we see people who are married to a certain candidate. They know nothing about the candidate, but they know he's the one, he's the chosen. How do you know that? Mm -hmm. I just know. Well, that's an identity belief because yeah. that person has been sort of brought into a sense of who they are as a tribe, their value system, the symbol that they might, uh, you know, the banner they may wave. I don't know. I can go on and on about that kind of stuff. Dave, forgive me for yeah. babbling. Go ahead, brother. I, know, go ahead. Yeah. I think it's... Uh one of the points I think we've touched on here is that when you come out of a belief sister system or an epistemology that you found was based on shaky for sh on shaky reasons, then you could, you can go through a stage or maybe be there forever where you find your, it's hard to trust yourself because you believed one thing 
for so I mean I know I believed I believed in in evangelical Christianity for over 35 years and devoutly and so when I came out of that and let go of that then I'm looking okay what what can I trust myself to believe in now if if I was fooled that long about something that important how do I know I can trust myself and right. it, it can leave you in a state of real uh, discombobulation where you don't have an equilibrium. And, it, and I was there for several years where I just didn't know who I was or how to find a sense of who I was, much less how to find a tribe that I could identify did you ever, with. Did you ever feel like you were in a state of like almost grief and uh, of uh, not, not just grief, but uh, uh, hypocrisy? Because now that you've left your former beliefs behind, for something that you said that you would never believe? Yeah, I don't know if hypocrisy, maybe um, a sense of uh, being a fraud, you know, the imposter syndrome kind of thing, like, like I was just, did I really believe? I knew I did, but if, if, I can, if that can dissolve, of course I had people telling me I didn't ever really believe. That was, that's one of the go-to answers when you de deconvert. But uh, I knew I did. I knew I, I had given everything I could to it. But grief, oh yeah. I mean, I, there were times I was sobbing on the floor because mm -hmm. I, I just didn't know what yeah. to do without that that's, sense of faith. That, that, that you say sobbing on the floor, that brings back a lot of memories for me. I don't know if you, either one of you have seen the movie The Apostle, but that's kind of like harkens back to my relationship with God. That's like how I would kind of approach him, you know, just kind of shaking my hands at him, just asking him, yelling, just answer one prayer, and then I'll, I'll just remain faithful. But, like, I never saw any of my, my simplest prayers get answered, you know? Yeah, that's, I share that experience. I preached that God answered his prayer, but if I was truly honest, I didn't see it happening. And, and a, a lifetime of that takes a toll on you. Yeah, it's funny. I always point. talk about prayer, like driving by a casino billboard. You never see them put the losers up, do you? You know, <laughs> Bob and Jane Smith lost thirty thousand dollars at roulette. Yeah. You know, you never, you never <laughs> see that. You only see the random people who, you know, who might hit. Meanwhile, every time you drive by the casino, they've built a new wing from the losses yeah. of the people who have been devastated. And I found that there might be a parallel there about prayer. My final word for you, I think, would be, honestly, understanding how the brain works, how we receive and perceive and embrace or reject ideas. Brain psychology has been huge for me in the last several years. And secondly, give yourself some grace. Don't yeah. beat yourself up for not having the answer, for not knowing. We all want to know. We hate not knowing. But sometimes the answer is, I don't know. And give yourself some grace on that. Give some self. Give yourself grace about what you did in your past and what you thought that was wrong or dumb or whatever. I think we've all got to do that. That'll free you right. up a little bit, I think, in your mind and heart to move forward. It'll be, I think, a, a lighter load for the journey ahead, okay? No, definitely. Great encouraging words, you two. Great encouraging words. Uh, one quick thing, so while I got Seth on the line, I would be remiss if I didn't ask this question about the Gilgamesh epic, because I know you love getting questions about it. Uh, the Gilgamesh epic, two questions. Uh, have, well, three questions. Have you seen the stones in person? I think you have, if I recall correctly. Um, and do, what would you say they were carved out with? Do they, do they know? And what is the illusions between the young lady who tempted uh, 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 Inkadu out of the perfect garden and Lilith, Adam's first wife in the Bible? You could speak okay, briefly. Well uh, then let's end the call and let me speak to that very quickly as best I can. Sure, yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Sean. First of all, I have not seen the epic of I've not seen those uh, cuneiform tablets, uh, the single tablet in person. I have not. Um, secondly, I'm not sure that Lilith relates to the Gilgamesh myth. I think it is simply the uh, the ancient Mi Middle Eastern myth that predated the Noah's Ark myth by, I think, about a thousand years, and the parallels are amazing. And I narrated, which just released for Dr. Joshua Bowen, who is an Assyriologist and an expert on the ancient Near East and the uh, biblical Old Testament. He did a whole book, a series of books on 
uh, the parallels between other myths in the ancient Near East and the Hebrew Bible. And it's fascinating. You'll see all kind of crossover in there. And, mm-hmm. and so if you're interested in that kind of thing, look up uh, the work by Dr. Joshua Bowen. He's, oh, he's, he's, he's amazing. Yeah, he's the best. And you know, uh, let me, let me mention guy. something else because the caller brought up a great idea or uh, something that made me think about this. I've heard people say, once I came out of the faith and they see that I'm a full-time atheist activist, I'm out here, you know, banging the drum as best I can. And I'm, I go pretty hard at religion. And they will say this to me. They'll say, well, you know what? I don't care. It doesn't matter what I say to you about Jesus. You'll never change your mind. You're not, you're not ever going to change your mind. And I just want to shake them. Dave, yeah. you're looking at someone who has changed his mind yeah. on almost every significant belief he ever held. Yeah. So if there's anybody who has shown it's possible to change their minds, it would be someone like me and it would be someone like you. I just found that was a weird sort of a, a an attempt to shut down the uh you know the disbelief in their specific god and religion anyway yeah go ahead. it is because we we have done that and and i i encourage people all the time when they're dealing with family members or whatever and they'll they'll say things like that you know my my dad would never change his mind my brother my wife whatever yeah. and i'll say to them didn't you yeah. didn't you are they how are they different from you the the right set of circumstances the right timing all these things come into play and and people can begin to examine things more differently than they did before and more strenuously i do worry yeah. that we too easily write people off and sometimes we have to i mean sometimes i do yeah. I, we've met people i think that are, you're they're too far gone or if there's someone who can help change their mind it ain't going to be me i don't have the gift you know but i did a speech um i guess it's been a year and a half ago called you are evil and you must be destroyed and it talked mm-hmm. about how you know what if you were to go and just put on blast and just destroy go on twitter destroy their reputation in their life somebody who was a a hardcore right-wing christian nationalist maga type it would have been a reagan type back then i was anti-gay I was, uh, you know, anti-LGBT rights. I thought Muslims were all terrorists. I just, you know, I, I had all kinds of bad ideas. You know, if you had seen me 20 years ago, would you have mm-hmm. come after me and destroyed me and given up on me and dehumanized me and thought I'm a lost cause? Because if you had, then the last 14 whatever years of activism that I've been able to do as an atheist might not have ever happened because I would have, right. would have there would not have been a space for me in this world and um you know i i think sometimes you got to draw the hard line sometimes you got to burn the bridge but i think we're much too eager to do that i sure would like to see us try to seek opportunities for change because if you can change dave and if i can change there's a good chance others can change as well yep you're right that's that's a good word we've got lines open but i want to remind you 720-619-2288 and there are several ways to support the channel the show you can go to patreon.com slash call the line. Um, always need more Patreon support there. And also super chats. Uh, we love those. I remind you that every super chat over $5, $5 or more, we will read that on the air at the end of the show. Seth and I will take turns doing that. So if you have a question or a comment for either one of us or just something you want to say, throw it in a super chat and send it our way and we'll read it at the show. Let's take another call. We've got Paul, he, him in Texas, a theist, wants to discuss why he believes in God. You're on the line with Dave and Seth. What's on your mind, Paul? Uh, hi, Dave. How are you doing? How are you doing tonight? Sorry about that. My dogs decided to start going barking here right when I start talking. But at any rate, yeah, I would like to discuss that with y'all if I could tonight. Sure. Tell us what your thoughts are. First of all, I, I I haven't watched you. I watched Matt before, and and I heard him say you had a- ALS, and you look great, man. You look like you're doing wonderful, and uh, uh, I just hope you know. I know you'll continue to do well, and you're very courageous. That's the first thing I want to say to you. And you, 
first of all, uh, I myself, before I get into my what I had happened a couple of years ago, um, why I believe in Jesus, why I love Jesus with all of my heart. Um, you know, there there are a million religions out there, as you all both know. Um, and Jesus makes it clear, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In my heart, uh, Dave, um, that's why I be- believe why I'm a Christian and why I put all my faith and trust on those words that Jesus spoke. I can't prove to you that um, that he's real. I can, and I, to come on here and lie to you, uh, tell you that I can, would be a lie. And I'm not going to do that. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, I feel in my heart, and I just have placed my trust in Him that those words are true. What and would uh, you, you say? just tell me when you want me to be quiet, and you want to say something, and I will. Well, okay, I just wanted to ask you there. What would you sure. say to a person in another part of the world in any right. of those thousand religions that you mentioned who would say to you mm-hmm. the same thing about their God, that they just have a personal faith, their their God is said to them, they're the only God, and they truly believe that that's, their God is the way, the truth, and the life, which would exclude Jesus from being the only way. So what would you say to that person who had just as strong a belief as you do? Okay, Dave, uh, if you're ready for me to answer, we have a delay here, so I don't want it to seem like I'm talking over you because I'm not. Well, you just tell me to hush and I will hush or whatever. But uh, but, but the reason that I would tell them that, I would say to them, out of all the religions that I know of, and you correct me on this if I'm wrong, I don't know of any other God that has gone to the cross and endured all the suffering and pain that the Bible tells us Jesus endured or any other God that has made the claims that Jesus has made. If you do, you could tell me. I'm listening. Seth, you want to speak to the claim of the dead and resurrected Christ? Okay, well, sure. there's a lot to unpack here. First of all, Christ is not the only dying and rising God in mythology and quote-unquote history. I believe uh, the god Inanna, the Egyptian god, was also crucified. Uh, Christ isn't the only virgin birth. I want to say, uh, was it Perseus who was also born of a virgin and had a divine father? There are so many similarities between the Christ salvation story and the salvation stories of other previous uh, religious traditions or mythologies. These predate Christianity often by thousands of years. Secondly, You are drawing the story of Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life, from the scriptures. You're drawing this out of the biblical New Testament. But authorship of the biblical New Testament, of all the books that you might quote to me, authorship has never been verified. These books were written up to 70, 80 years after the alleged birth, life, and death of Jesus Christ. So can you tell me, do you know who the author of that verse is, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, who actually put pen to parchment or whatever and wrote that 2,000 years ago? I believe it's in John 14, 6 is the verse, and if I'm not mistaken, John was the one that recorded that. Now, I could be wrong on that. I'm not a bi- oh, biblical actually, scholar. I read my Bible. Well, that, uh, that's okay. That's what I think, but that's part of the point that I'm trying to make. John, there is not a John that actually, oh, okay. we don't know that a John actually wrote the book. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were not written by a Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. In fact, they speak about these characters in the third person. And authorship, even among Christian theologians, continues to be debated today because God refuses to part the curtain of the sky and simply tell us who wrote the book. We also have to ask why God would choose a book to communicate his message to the entire planet in a time when most people, especially in that region, were illiterate. They could not read or write. It seems a bizarre choice for me. But, you know, quoting a book to prove the book is not going to get you all that far with us. And uh, if someone came to you and quoted the Quran to prove Muhammad's love for his people, would you accept that the way you want us to accept you quoting the Bible? Uh, you right. You want me to answer that or, okay. Mm -hmm. No, no, I wouldn't accept the Quran. I respect their right to believe that. Just like I respect your right not to believe it as I've stated before. 
I just happen to believe it. Jesus spoke a lot about faith, and he did that for a reason. If he peeled the sky out open and waved, I believe that would be too easy. He wouldn't have suffered like he did and spoken so much about faith like he did. You know, faith is a big part of this this uh, this religion that I'm yeah. in, as you well know, uh, Seth. Well, a yeah, big part, you know. and Jesus spoke a lot about it. Look at Doubting Thomas. What did he tell Doubting Thomas after Doubting yeah. Thomas? touched his nail scarred hands when he wouldn't believe now hush and let you talk go ahead yeah well as you know both you may not know this but both seth and i came out of that faith-filled uh religious ideology and um we both used to believe the things that you now believe or claim to believe and i understand why you believe what you do or what you're saying you believe but i think you would have to admit maybe not have to but consider upon Seth's statements earlier, there's not a lot of evidence for what you're saying is true. When you claim that Jesus did this or Jesus said that, it's all based upon a book written by supposedly men who had an agenda, but we don't know who they are. And the things were written decades after the events were supposed to have happened. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of ways that that can go wrong. Just play a game of tele a telephone at a party and see how that can happen. So it seems to me, Paul, that you basically are boiling it down to you've had an experience in your heart with Jesus and you want to believe that what he says is true because that's what you want to believe, regardless of whether there's evidence to support it. Is that a fair statement? Uh, well, Dave, um, it, it to me, like you have stated, you're right, and to come on here and tell you I can prove that, like, I heard it stated one time, you can put, you can't put God in a test tube, but you can just tell people the number of lives, millions of lives, he's changed daily. That's all I can do, man, to sit here and tell you, oh, yes, I, I cannot prove I wasn't there. I just know what the Bible teaches, and I believe it through the power of the Holy Spirit. I respect mm -hmm. the fact that you don't, and that's fine. You know, I, can I ask you a I'm question, just, Paul? Yeah. Sure. You'd mentioned that if God was to part the curtain of the sky and just tell us it would be too easy. With heaven mm -hmm. and hell in the balance, and right now with two-thirds of the planet worshiping another God or none at all, right? With so much on the line, do you find it a moral thing for God to be purposefully vague when God could clear things up? so that there was absolutely no question. I mean, even if you look at the specific denominations within Christianity, they're arguing about the basics. They don't agree on most of anything. Literal creation, uh, was the flood a global flood? Do you have eternal security when you get saved or can you lose your salvation? How do you baptize? Is there a hell? What's the end times like? Speaking in tongues, blah, blah, blah. So with all of this squabbling and disagreement and splintering and confusion, why would the God who is not the author of confusion just come down and say, here is my message as clear as I can make it. It's unmistakable. Now you have the information so you can make the best choice. Wouldn't that seem a reasonable thing for a benevolent God to do? Uh, Seth, you know, to be honest with you, um, and, and um, just I'll just state like this, you know the Bible probably is better than I do. A lot of times atheists do know the Bible as well as Christians, and that is a fact. But I will tell you, the God of the Bible is a God of justice. He's a God that doesn't tolerate sin, and he wiped out many places and things that in our human minds we may think is rough and immoral, but we must remember we are not God. He okay. is God. Well, we, oh, we as humans on. have a fallen nature. I do, for sure. And oh, if, I'm if, forgive my interjection, but sinner, I'm, I'm, asked, I'm begging grace, you to answer more. my question. I, I, I get that. Okay. Uh, it's a fallen world and God has to get nasty sometimes because blah, blah, blah. What I'm asking is my original mm -hmm. question, with so much at stake, why wouldn't a benevolent, loving parent of all human children be as clear as he could possibly be so we could make the best choice? You ready for me to answer that, Seth? I don't want to cut in on you, man. We got no, a no, delay. No, I don't want to talk over you. Okay, you ready? Yeah, I, yes, I am ready. ready. 
Okay. Okay, man. I just don't want to seem rude. It's a delay here. No, I believe, again, I believe the reason that he doesn't do that, he doesn't come down and he gave us his Bible and he talked a lot about faith. Do you think people that don't want anything to do with him in this world are going to be happy with him in the next world? Hell was originally not- created for Satan and his angels. That's who's ultimately going there. But there's going to be people that, that don't want any part of him in this life uh, that are going to be there, according to the Bible. That's not what I no. said, but that's what the Bible teaches. Paul, so I think, I think we have point. his word. We just have to choose if we believe it or not. But the word is very murky. And Seth's point was that Christians, not only other religions, but Christians, argue vehemently over what the word of God means. The same, the different Christians reading the same Bible and coming to different conclusions about what faith is and what the important parts of faith are. That's not enough. And Seth's point, I think you keep missing or glossing over it on purpose. I don't know. It, it'd be like no, me. No, I'm as sorry. A I'm, I'm trying to be honest. I'm not. I'm trying to be That's honest, fine. honestly. I, I believe it. You you're, you're seem like a very nice guy. <clears throat> if I was a father, like Seth said, there's so much at stake death and life, heaven and hell. If I was a father and I had children that I cared about and I cared about whether they lived or died, and I sent them to cross a busy interstate without any traffic lights or any guidance. And I and and the the cars on the interstate had no headlights and the the kids just had to cross the best they could. And maybe some get across and maybe some don't. It'd be a lot easier uh, to turn lights on and make things more clear. But that's as you said earlier, that's just too easy for God to part the skies and come down and tell us what is and what isn't. Let's make it hard so that people have to put faith into it even though some might get it wrong and might perish and spend eternity in hell, still it's worth it for God to play this cat and mouse game so that people have to um, exert faith in order to get it right. That doesn't seem like a loving, uh, caring God. You use the word just God, which seems like some Christians seem to want to focus more on God's justice than his love. And you talked about him wiping out whole civilizations because he's a just God. Um, That's that's troublesome to me, that Christians would focus more on the justice and the um, anger of God rather than his love and compassion. That's just me, though. Hey, Dave, uh, uh, yeah, Dave, can I say something to that? Or will you let me, or? You've got the floor. Oh, okay. I'm sorry to delay. No, Seth, I, yeah. I believe God is a God of justice, but I like because I am a sinner who's just as fallen, just as short and unworthy of salvation as anybody you would ever meet. Um, I'm not a perfect Christian, and for any Christian that says he is, they're lying. But what I believe God is such a loving God because he came down, and I is my belief that he came down went to a cross, was beaten, denied, rejected, yeah. spit upon. I can't even humanly comprehend all Jesus suffered. And then he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yeah. How many of us we, could do we, that if we were we, being we, treated like hey, that? I, I think I'm good, Dave. Paul, I think Paul, I'm good. Let, let, me, let me stop you there. I mean, you've repeated that yeah, a lot. Dave, we're, okay. we're letting you get okay. a lot of Bible quotes in tonight, and that's that's okay. Because we. I guess I'll leave you with this final cut. We, we need to move on. But you, you stated okay. earlier that a lot of atheists know the Bible better than you and a lot of better. A lot of them do know it. Mm -hmm. And, and doesn't that bother you when you put your faith in the Bible and that's what causes you to believe so much. And yet we know the same book better than a lot of Christians and we don't believe. Um, No, that that would bother me as a Christian. Just saying. No, it doesn't bother me because again, you can't force people to believe. You, you right. do. Y'all, you're very two smart fellas there. I mean, I would say that myself. You are, I, and I think you're both fine gentlemen. Uh, that doesn't bother me. I mean, um, I wish you would, you know, trust Jesus, but that's your decision ultimately to make. I can't make it for you. Only, mm-hmm. the, only the person can, and the Holy Spirit can change any heart. Right. At, at well, work. And can I add one more thing about 
all the different arguments about different things. I would agree with that, with the denominations and arguments. But the one thing you can be sure of, all the true believers, there's only one way to salvation is through the cross and placing your mm-hmm. trust. If you have yeah. faith and place your trust we, in Jesus, we you that, that, Paul. We're you gonna, know. I'm going to stop you there. I think you've, okay. you've stated that okay, enough. Dave, this okay, Dave, okay. This is not a Thanks, soapbox. Okay. Well, nice, ta- nice talking okay. to y'all, and thank you for taking my call. Okay. I really appreciate thank it, man. You, thank you. And right. uh, I enjoy talking with y'all. All right. You're a nice guy. Bye, Paul. Okay. It's interesting, so, Dave. Is an example, um, Seth. Um, I asked a question, no. and the answer was <laughs> apparently to a different question. He's, and, he's uh, preaching. He, he believes, and this is something I've seen on other callers, um, from other callers. They've come on with a mission to preach the gospel. And, and you know the, the verse, I can't recall it right now, but the, the word of the Lord doesn't return void, and it goes out and it does the work it's intended. Uh, I think Paul is of the mindset of others that if they just get the words out over the microphones, over the airwaves, that the Holy Spirit will then take those words and miraculously transfer them around the world and influence hearts. So that's why he kept, you know, for those of you that try to do this, we're on to you. That's well, why he kept trying to repeat the things over and over, just basic gospel talking points. I, I had to wonder, though, if a lot of that is just, that's the script we were taught. You know, yeah. uh, I believe it on faith. Jesus died for yeah. our sins. We were all born sinners, blah, blah, blah. We all deserve judgment. God is a, a just God. He's a loving God, but a just God. I mean, a lot of these are the, it's, he was kind of going through a Rolodex of a lot of the, exactly. the things that we were taught <laughs> to just regurgitate, right? It, that's it. And, it's, and so it's I the, feel like when I would challenge and say, hey, I've got a legitimate question here. The, the, what you do is you go back into the arsenal that you have been using on the order of maybe decades of your life. You know? And I didn't even get to the point where, to tell Paul that the Bible doesn't e- even agree with itself. So no. not only does the planet not agree on a religion or do the specific Christians agree on their theology, but the Bible has contradicting versions of the most basic stories about Christ from his birth to his death death and even to the empty tomb four conflicting accounts of of uh, Jesus's empty tomb you know and i think if you and i know the bible better than he does and we don't believe what a good point that was you know doesn't yeah, that that should bother that, every christian you know that doesn't it bother you that we know it better than you do and we have a problem we just, believe, and, uh, we just that, don't believe it though yeah that's a great that's no. a great line i'm going to use that yeah. somewhere so yeah. you're welcome yeah feel free, yeah. Feel free to steal it. i'll give you credit i'll give you credit send me the royalties of all the money you make on that statement you got it you got I'm it. i'm going to get rich i know i am um but yeah it's like a politician at a debate they ask them a question and they go right back to the points that they came to say it doesn't matter the question I'm here to talk about X, Y, Z, and that's what I'm going to do. And that's kind of what Paul was doing. And that's a tactic I've seen before. We're going to get these gospel message points out so that the Holy Spirit can take them across the waters. But do you feel, though, that that being on it was not necessarily an agenda as much as being able to address the question, the specific question, the only answer would be one that was already here. So it's not like, yeah. you know, he, he had called because he was trying to be a missionary. Well, maybe he was. But I got also the impression that he just, you know, there was nowhere to go. So he retreated and took this path over here, answering the question that was not asked. I don't know. We we could speculate all day about it. It's interesting. Well, he was a nice guy. Yeah, uh, nice fellow. uh, We got Deepak in New Zealand. He, him. Hello, Deepak. I'm sorry. I'm sure that's how you say it. You're on the line with Dave and Scott. What can we do for you? Hey, Dave. Hi, Seth. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Lovely. Hey, look, um, I'm just calling because um, I, I had to call him when I heard that Seth was on the show. Um, he's been a big part of my deconversion going back five years. So it's really cool um, to get in touch with you guys and, and have a quick conversation if you could. Um, yeah, so I've um, the, re- the main reason I'm calling in really is um, I, I began deconverting probably 2018, so going back five, five or six years now. Um, a lot of it was watching Seth's um, 
Thinking Atheist channel, which was really awesome back then. Um, back then for me, I mean, and it was great. You know, I was just hooked on to it, going back, um, going to work, driving back home, watching those shows that gave me so much of insight. Um, the the main reason I'm calling now really is because I haven't really come out to many people uh, publicly as an atheist. It's been something that's going through my mind for a while, and I've been thinking of really the nicest or the best possible way to do this um, without too much vitriol or without really getting in conflict with people. Um, and the main person I want to have this conversation with is with, with, is with my stepmother because she's um, she's been she, she's a, a fundamental Christian, but probably around eight years ago she began uh, converting, if you will, to to this really strange belief um, called Hope of Israel Ministries, which, from what I understand, is similar to what this guy called Herbert Armstrong preached, which was basically um, the lost tribe of Israel were English or something to that effect, and um, they have a really, really, I guess, a Jewish belief, and she follows the Sabbath and really, really odd stuff. Um, and it's it's really normally I wouldn't, you know, try and spoil someone's um, belief if they're really living a good, a happy life. But in, in in her case, I can see it's really she's taken it so seriously. Like it's it's really I think affecting her quality of life, and she doesn't see it. Um, and I'm not trying to deconvert her or anything. It's just I, I just want to have a conversation that I'm no longer a believer myself, and and you know I'm living as a free thinker, so to speak. Um, and I know both of you have been through that journey uh, in your own right. So I just really want to discuss this with you and see what you think is is the best approach to to someone like this, and and just extended fundamental Christians as well, because my whole family are fundamental Christians. Um, but primarily, it's my stepmother that I'm mainly looking at having a good conversation with. Yeah, there's a lot here. Um, Seth and I have both experienced issues with family members around our deconversion mm -hmm. and the difficulty with that. Um, I'm going to let Seth speak to it in a minute, but I would... I would focus more on what you said there at the end, not trying to deconvert family members, but just simply letting them know who you are and what changes you've made. Cause you have one life. This is your one life. And I've experienced family members who've been disappointed by my change in faith, my lack of faith, my loss of faith, my atheism. And they've let me know mm -hmm. that. And, and I've lost relationships with many of them. But I stand clearly on, on this position that I am who I am, and I have a right to be who I am. I have an obligation to be who I am. And it's the one life I get. This is it. This is my shot. And I'm not going to live it for someone else. I'm not going to live it based upon someone else's opinion of what I should be. Even if I was a mm -hmm. person before, I have the right to change my mind. And I did change my mm -hmm. mind. And so I told my family members that. And I don't apologize for being that and telling them that because mm -hmm. I, I felt like it was the right thing mm -hmm. to do. Now, not everybody comes out at the same time or at the same way that I did. I was just out there. And I, I know there are very many reasons for not coming out or for coming out carefully or slowly to different family members. And I respect all of those. But it is your life. And when you say that you're concerned about your stepmother and the, the toxic faith that she's in, I, I, I get that. I'm concerned, too, with these things. But you're, it sounds like your, your primary priority in, in coming out would be to express to her simply who you are. And I, I think that's good i like that seth thoughts well i i understand the frustration it's almost like if you have someone in your family who is an addict and you're like you you see some of the damage done and you want to be an agent of intervention but you can't make someone not be an addict you you can't make someone choose to walk away 
to get help, to seek treatment, to choose a better path. You can encourage them. You can maybe open the door to options. You can have meaningful discussions because you care. But I would encourage you, don't make her life your burden any more than I think would be healthy, you know, healthy, natural concern. Secondly, I think your journey is about you. So if you are speaking about your own lack of faith, where you are, I think that needs to be as much about sort of a demarcation of where you are in your life, a revelation to other people. Here's kind of where I am, and that's good. I'm good. You need to know this. I appreciate that. I'd love to have some discussions about belief and those types of things. But I think the journey has to start by being about use. And finally, I worry a little bit that you will blame yourself if you come out to relatives and things go south. They flip out, they begin to paw at you or pray over you in an inappropriate way. They spread rumors about you. They cut you off. You just never know what loved ones will do, quote unquote, loved ones. And so I have to say that if that happens, it's not your fault. It is a revelation that their love for you was always conditional upon mm -hmm. validation. And if your difference of position and opinion and value system on this thing is enough to make them lose their minds and freak out, that's their fault. It is not yours. Mm -hmm. But there's, you're talking to somebody who doesn't have a relationship with his mother. You know, uh, I've, I came out to my, my parents and it, it was awful until my father passed away two years ago. And it was so awful with my mother that we don't speak and, and you have to be prepared for those types of consequences. But again, mm -hmm. even in my own case, it's not my fault that we don't speak. It's, it, I established that the, here is a boundary. And if you cross the boundary, there will be consequences. The boundary was crossed. The consequence kicked in. But I don't have a magic bullet on, you know, having these conversations with loved ones in my own life. My family has really been families like this one here in my own community and Natalie and, and her kids and those types of things. My family's taken mm -hmm. a different form. So forgive the long answer, but that's all I've got. No, I, I greatly appreciate that, both of you. Um, that's that's really good. I mean, so I, I think I've my thoughts are really similar to yours already in terms of um, what what I'm doing, how to approach this. Um, just just one more thing on this um, on what I was saying um, in terms of her belief. Um, I, you know, I, I've come out to a few close friends and, and others, and we've had good discussions on um, just on on faith and you know just just a, a good um, good spirited debate, um, which was great. I mean, neither of us changed each other's minds, but it was a really healthy conversation, and um, you know we left it at that. Right now, the issue with um, with my stepmother in particular is because of the. I don't know what's the be how the, what's the best way to convey this, but basically she's the type who, and I think you both probably know people like this who believe in dreams and visions, prophecies. Um, she might have a a dream one day and and you know say God told me this, and she does things based on that, and and that's what really scares me. It's not you know she's not really well grounded in that sense. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you have anything additional to say yeah. about that or, or this, let me you jump heard in. of this particular belief, which is... Let me, really let me jump in with me. something that might actually be helpful instead of me whining about my own situation, all right? <laughs> I, think, sure. I think good faith conversations are something we should pursue. I think you must lead with genuine concern. Melanie Teresa King has this great line, I don't know if she came up with it or she uh, was just quoting somebody else, but it said, people won't care what you think unless they think that you care. Or maybe it's people won't care what you believe unless they believe that you care. If she senses real empathy and goodwill, you're not coming in to condescend, but you're coming in because you care. I think that's where you start. Your intent has to be sincere and good. Secondly, I just use a lot of questions. 
there may be a chance that she's never actually thought about why she believes what she believes. Well, how do you know this dream is true? What, how, do, how do you tell the difference between this dream or that dream? If someone had a different dream in conflict, how would you know those things? The Socratic method, which is a great place to have conversations without someone feeling attacked. I also strategically would keep those initial conversations short, meaning I wouldn't try to go in and fix Rome in a day. I wouldn't go in thinking, all right, we're going to have it out. And before you know it, you get sucked in, two hours pass, voices get raised, everybody gets frustrated. I would keep those initial exchanges relatively short put a toe in the water, introduce a few questions, have some laughs. All right, you know what? Well, I mean, let's talk about this again, maybe down the way. Give everybody a chance to breathe. And then over the course of the next days and weeks and months, find opportunities to maybe have slightly lengthier discussions. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to do it all at once. I think that almost always fails, okay? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I really liked um, what what you did a long time back, which was, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you sent out an email to a few important people, just letting them know where you are, um, and at least gave them a heads up on that, uh, or in yeah. terms of having an individual conversation, which would go down in a bad way. Um, I probably no, that was not part of bold my... enough to do that. Um, That's valid, right? too. It, it's part of my journey that I wrote a letter ex kind of explaining because nobody was really talking about it. They were whispering, but that was also a chance for me to sort of try to hammer out in my own brain to clarify kind of where I was. And that may be the right move for you or not, but lead with goodwill, ask a lot of questions. Don't try to, you know, shoe the whole horse on the same day. What a terrible metaphor that was. Dear God, that's two yeah, in a row. Exactly. On the same show. Sorry about that. Know. Yeah. yeah, sorry. And, uh, and give yourself some, you know, some time and some oxygen, and you, you never know. But if it doesn't work out, it's not your fault. Okay, yeah. just remember that. And be it's patient. Not your fault. Be patient with yourself and your family members, and just recognize also that I know your stepmom is the one you're most concerned about, and she's pretty deep into some fundamentalism. This this is a shock to their systems, and they don't have a category for this. In most cases, they don't know where to put this. So it's going to take some time for them to process it, and and sometimes they never do. Like in Seth's case with his mom, in my case with other family members I have, they just don't they don't ever get there. They haven't yet gotten there in terms of how to how to have relationship with someone who's gone through this kind of change, and they don't have a category to put it in. So just recognize that's going to be the case with most of them if they have these deeply held beliefs and um, just be patient with the process and do the best you can and come back and let us know how it's going from time to time. And thanks for the kind words. Yeah. It really is an encouragement to me. I, I very much appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. Seth. Thank you so much. And thanks Dave as well. All the best with you and, and what you're going yeah. through. Um, it's been really a pleasure enjoying listening to you both and on different shows and uh, I'll continue following you both. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Deepak. What's that sound in the background? I didn't want to. I didn't know. It sounded like either dragging something across a, a floor or someone in the background snoring. I couldn't figure snoring it out. Snoring, or so. maybe I, yeah, I didn't know what that was. I didn't want to interrupt want to uh, his thought. You issue. know, but I, the whole time I was thinking, wow, is it just me hearing that? That was weird. weird. Yeah, it was all of America, yeah. all of the world <laughs> hearing all it. The world, you know. <laughs> he was in New Zealand. I shouldn't say all of America. That was, that oh, was stupid. No. Anyway. Michael, let's talk to Michael. He, him in New York. You're on the line with Dave and Seth. How can we help you? Well, hi, fellas. I uh, appreciate you taking my call. I, uh, I'm a, an atheist. I'm a, I'm a skeptic. Um, I'm an engineer, so I hang out with a lot of people who are very data-driven people. Those are a lot of the conversations we have. Or, you know, what evidence do we have that this is the case? And what are the test results? And really following the data. And that's sort of my worldview. Uh, you know, I publish research and you can't publish something if you can't back up what you're saying. So that's I'm, I'm sort of I'm a very empirical minded person. And something that I've noticed a lot recently talking to close friends and family is that people who are very smart and very logical will get to this, usually a God concept or, or 
karma or something like that. And then they'll, and I'll say, well, you know, what, what evidence do you have for, to think that is true? And they'll say, well, there are some things you just take on faith. Some things you just yep. have to take on faith. And I always say, you know, this is an interesting thing to me. It seems to me like cognitive dissonance because you're using a totally different evidentiary standard and logical standard for this one, this one idea than everything else in your life. And, and how do you deal with that? And they just kept coming back to, well, there are some things you've got to take on faith. So I, I guess I'm interested in where did that concept come from? It seems like it's almost viewed as meritous and, or uh, virtuous in some ways to just shut off your reason when it comes to certain things. And I'm sure y'all have dealt with a lot more of that than I have, but I'm not, you know, in the business of trying to tear anybody down or, or point out that they're wrong, but I am very much fascinated by, by this sort of cognitive dissonance occurring in, in oh, very I, reasonable I people. Them down and oh, I'm sorry, wrong. David. That's what I do. Go ahead, brother. No, go, go ahead. ahead, Seth. I was just making a stupid joke. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I walked all over <laughs> you. I walked all yeah, over that's, you. That's, yeah, it's probably best that you did. It, it's a revelation about how modular the brain really is, right? We can be rational and logical and rational and logical, and then there's a spot, and we can all be guilty of having this. I call it the place in the brain where the weird shit lives, right? So I'm totally rational about all this other stuff. And then I'm over here going, you know, aliens or, or you know, <laughs> a, some other some other thing, you know, like we just released the ghost stories podcast, which I do for fun. But you will find people who don't believe in gods and monsters, but they might believe in spirits, but they aren't using the same tests. They aren't using the same method to determine whether or not this warrants belief, right? Not that they're using it over here with God, with Allah, Thor, Wotan, Krishna, whoever, but they're not using it with great uncle Valney who appeared in the bathroom on a Wednesday night at 1 a.m., right? Well, what's that about? And I, I, I think there's a ton of stuff going on. It fascinates me. It's almost like Francis Collins, right? Francis mm -hmm. Collins heads up the Human Genome Project, and he, he, he can see in our DNA that we are evolved creatures. We are evolved higher primates, debunking, debunking the whole Adam and Eve story in the Bible. And he right. still believes the Bible. He's not an idiot, right? He's a really smart guy. How did he get there? And I don't have the answer beyond the fact that I think sometimes smart people know how to outsmart themselves. <laughs> they know how to connect dots that were never meant to be connected. Maybe the desire to believe because we can all, as human beings, be led around by our emotions. Does some of it speak to programming? What's his background? Was he raised to see this as normal so he's more willing to accept it? I don't know, Dave. I'm, I'm you know, I don't have, uh, I, I don't have a I'm definitive catch-all answer. I'm baffled too, Michael and Seth, because I've I've encountered this as we all have over and over again in that otherwise brilliant, smart, normal, normally intelligent people give themselves a free pass intellectually when it comes to faith. And it's as you said, Michael, it's almost it's considered a virtue. I just believe you have to take it on faith. And I just, I think it comes down to our need to tell our, ourselves stories that make us feel good. Um, whether it's true or not, don't bother me with that. I need to feel good about eternity. I need to feel good about seeing mom again one day. I need to feel good about my life not being finite and um, imperfect. I need to tell myself stories that make me feel good about life and death and the future and the world around us. That's the only explanation I can come up with. And it's not a good one for Mike, why I was in uh, divorce themselves uh, from their intelligence when it comes to this. Do you like Mike or Ma I call you Michael, forgive me. I was in Chicago and I met an atheist and he seemed whip smart. And I want to say he was an engineer. He was a flat earther. Now, yeah. you know, engineers, oh, dear. so oh, dear. do you think that problematic, do you think that engineers are able to take the gears of a sort of a mental gears of a machine and move them so that they work in ways never intended or not appropriate? Do you think there's some of that going on? You know, I, the, the thing that I keep coming back to is 
it's the lack of reevaluation. Um, I, I just published a, a paper on a topic that has been accepted as true for 40 years in the industry. And every time I read about this topic, no one ever cited data. And I said, well, wait, everyone's just quoting everybody else. And I actually went and got the data and it turns out it's not true. Um, and so I think a lot of it is they decided it was true at one point in time or were told it was true at one point in time. And we grow and we learn and we mature and we get better at, you know, evaluating claims and stuff. But we don't always go back and reevaluate claims that we already decided on once. I think there may be some of that in there. I think yeah. you're absolutely spot on correct. I yeah, think there's so think much truth. truth to that. And it, 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 it does. I don't know. There has to, that has to be at least part of the answer. I remember when Dr. Ben Carson was running for president, this guy's a brain surgeon. You know, you always hear the, the joke when someone says, how hard, how hard can it be? It's not brain <laughs> surgery. <laughs> it's not rocket science, but, yeah. but this guy's an actual brain surgeon. And I, and I listen to him talk and I would think, I don't want him driving a bus that I'm riding. <laughs> much less operating on my brain. I just didn't, I could not connect the dots. I know. And, and he, know. he's a fervent believer, you know, a fervent Christian. And I just thought, I don't, I don't get the disconnect here. And it's frustrating. Uh -huh. Because there are books like written about this. I think one's called uh, "Why Smart People Believe Dumb Things." Uh, I'm I'm having a hard time drawing it from memory, but uh, I do. All I can say, brother, is that I sh I share your frustration, and I think it 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 reveals that we we are all flawed humans. We can all be flawed thinkers, and no matter how in intelligent we are, we can easily be deceived or outsmart ourselves. And I think this is a great example. Yeah. And remind ourselves yeah, that we can all have blind spots. We can all have blind spots about something that we consider to be true that may not be. Is there good evidence for it? And we, we're all susceptible to being fooled. Yeah. Sure. Well, that, that, that it's helpful, and I appreciate, uh, appreciate the conversation. Uh, thanks for what you do, and uh, hopefully I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Michael. Well, thank you for calling, Michael. We appreciate your support. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, somebody someone said what is something that a person from the 1970s would not believe was going on today and i i think my answer was flat earthers like the people in the 70s and I had the right off of I the heels possible. of the yeah. moon landing if we were to tell them that flat earth you know yes uh, people believe that uh the spaceships were traveling in the atmos flat <laughs> <laughs> you, know. you can drive off the edge of the world somewhere the sun is going is going like this and i just i and well when I'm you see we people to give him some definitive answers because we really nailed that shit who we? are part of like the flat earth society and you see them and a lot of these are engineer types they're you know, know. they're analytical types and it's i think that's such an interesting subject we could talk about all day but it, it also so, is maddening. I, I feel this frustration. Yeah, I do too. Let's talk to... Before, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Right before we take this next caller real quick, I did send a message yeah. to the group chat if you could take a look. Um, but that that's all I need you to do. Uh, we can take this last call and wrap it up. Me take a look at the group chat? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you could. Um, okay. Thanks. Okay, I usually don't have it up. but Yeah, you know. I know it's a pain in the ass. I'm sorry to ask you to do that. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's take this call from Ken. He, him in Florida. Ken, you're on the line with Dave and Seth. What's on your mind? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about what a previous caller brought up about the sacrifice that Jesus made. And when you think about it, he didn't really make that much of a sacrifice because that, what he basically gave up was a weekend. And now he's in heaven with his father forever. I mean, I know crucifixion would have to be a horrible way to die. But ultimately, he didn't make that big of a sacrifice in dying for us if that actually did indeed happen. Agreed. I think you make a good point, Ken. You know, I have nothing to I add. Just, I just well wanted stated. to bring that up because I hear that all the time, all the time. Yeah, Jesus yeah, had a I mean, really shitty weekend for your sins. You know, I've seen it out there, and I, I, it doesn't sound exactly. like a, a big deal okay, to me. Guys, well, 
Yeah. Well, I'm going to hang up, but love the show. Good All show. All right. Thank you, thank Jim. You. Some well, distortion you, on that call. Yeah. yeah weird. Uh, no, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, mean, yeah, I just finished just uh, another shameless plug. I just finished uh, narrating, and it will uh, release in a few weeks. The audiobook for Dr. David Madison. He has a new book out called Guessing About God that talks about some of this type of stuff dealing with Jesus. And one of the points he made that I thought was interesting is how the Bible deals with Christ when he's born. And I think there's a couple of verses about him when he's a kid. And then there's an omission of two decades before Jesus finally shows up and starts doing what he's doing at the age of 30. The Bible has no interest in 20 years of Jesus's life. Right. And no one has ever looked around and thought, what the hell? Like, what was Christ doing for 20 years? This is so carpenter. many questions. So many questions about the Jesus story. Hmm, interesting. Well, it's, it's like they only focus on the parts that matter in terms of um, death and resurrection and the virgin birth, things that have to do with salvation, getting someone saved. So the yeah. rest of it doesn't seem to matter, you know, that he was a carpenter for 30 years or whatever the hell he was doing. If I can jump back to, you know, Paul brought up something about he was kind of getting on to uh, doubting Thomas, right? How he was chastised for, uh, for not believing. And I always like to tell people that Thomas is my favorite disciple. Everybody else was like, yay, it's Jesus who has risen from the grave. And it was Thomas who wanted peer review. He's like, I'm not going to believe till you show me some nail holes, man. I want to see holes in the hands and feet, and I want to see the hole in your side. I want to see proof before I believe. And Christ said, blessed are those uh, you have seen and you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and believed. You know, yeah. the Bible says, uh, the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And I always thought to myself, why would you chast chastise someone for wanting to see proof for a claim that you are making. Thomas is my favorite disciple. And I don't know, maybe he is yours as well. Well, it, again, it's that whole mindset that we talked about earlier that the Bible encourages you not to think, not to ask, not to question. It, it's, it's, you're, you're supposed to be like a little child and just come and take it on faith. And because I think that the authors know that if you ask, too many questions. You, if you examine too closely, you're going to find problems with it. Like we talked earlier, those of us who know the Bible well don't believe in it. And those who don't know it so well, yeah, I'll believe in it. That's yeah. problematic to me. <laughs> problematic. Yes, I agree. Let's read a few super chats. And then I'm, as, as is the case with me, I can't go as long as some of these folks, my neck gets tired. Uh, again, part of the issue with ALS. I'll read the first and then we'll take turns, Seth. Um, 1999 from my buddy Greg Markowski. Thanks, Dave, for constantly having outstanding guests on your show like Seth. If I could, I'd post a photo of our Halloween decorations. Not as fabulous as his, but I think Seth would appreciate them. I'll give us a little insight there, Seth. What's Greg talking about? Well, I'm a big Halloween guy. And I I'm surprised that my neighbors haven't kicked me out because every year it's it's something else. Uh, one year I did all of the um I, I replicated a meme I'd seen with Freddie, Jason, and Michael Myers all sitting at a card table, and the banner in front said, The teenagers deserved it. Change our minds. Last year I did the Wizard of Oz and I built a tornado, a 10-foot rotating tornado. We built a little house with Dorothy in it. And Natalie was Glenda, and I was the Tin Man. And and the year before that, I had a boat. My sister had a little fishing boat, put it in my yard. I built a, a lake of lights around it and had skeletons rowing the river sticks. And there's a fog machine for mist. I'm that guy. So this year, a buddy of mine used pallet wood and built an electric chair. And I sort of tricked it out with a bunch of electrical looking stuff and some neon lights. We put a charred skeleton in it that waves to everybody. So there's this centerpiece electric chair with waving skeletons as people drive by. And I've been posting photographs. So everybody knows I'm huge into Halloween. It's my inner 12 year old simply will not go away. But uh, 
Thank you, Greg, Seth, for the kind disturbing. word. That's disturbing. Don't you get letters oh, from the neighbors that are angry that, with you? They love it. They, they, they love it. The uh, neighbors across the street have young kids. Every year, they're like, "When's he? it's October 1st. When's he going to put out his stuff? When's he? They will come by. They'll, they'll bring their relatives by when they come in from out of town. And on Halloween night, uh, it is crazy. Uh, we, wow. uh, we may have 800 kids come by. It's insane. It's just insane. That's a lot of and candy I love to it. give out, bro. That's a lot of candy. Yeah, we have to start saving early. <laughs> wow, have to that's start pretty saving cool. Early. That's, yeah. that's a high bar you've set there. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Uh, let's see. Am I reading this one from the Stacy's yes. Mom podcast? Hey, love you Stacey. both. Two of the nicest people in the atheist community, you were both impactful in my deconversion at different times, and I'm so thankful for your activism and a big heart. Thank you for the kind words. I think that's something that we, you know, those of us, especially ex-evangelicals who are trying to sort of sound the alarm and, and also be an encourager, I think everybody, sometimes we wake up in the morning and say, does it matter anymore? You know, is yeah. anybody listening? Does, does, it, it, does it impact anybody's life? especially given all the thousands of hours that go into a lot of what we do. So to say that the work is impactful is actually the, the greatest gift you could give us. And that's, uh, that's, that's amazing. So thank you for that. Yes. Thank you, Stacey. It truly is, Seth. Every time I get a letter or a message from someone that said that something I did or said helped them in any way, I'm just, I'm just thankful. I, I just, I don't ever get tired of hearing it, honestly. So it's good. Thank you. And and burnout's hard for activists. After all these years, I mean, Natalie will tell yeah. you, I have some days where I'm like, it doesn't matter. The world's, everything's shit, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's <laughs> just more insane. Nobody cares. And she's always like, you know, reeling me back in going, it does matter. Remember the email that you told me about it. Remember the guy mm -hmm. you met at the thing. And, and she brings me back from my melodrama and helps to refocus me that, yes, you know, we should keep Somebody's it. got to, Seth. You're such a drama yeah. queen. I am. I am. <laughs> I am. Ten dollars from I got cookies. Hey, cookies, Seth. I'm the weirdo who asked you for the high res scan of your cat. You said I couldn't pay you for it, but here I am anyway. Love you both. Hi, Dave. There you go. That was a fundraiser for recovering from religion, and as a joke, I said I was going to donate art. And I took in about eight seconds a Sharpie and I drew a picture of my cat and I held it up as a gag and everybody wanted a high res copy of it. I still can't explain it, but thank you for asking for it. It made me smile. Who knew how, how talented you were? That was an amazing cat, by the way. Missed my call. Yeah. I missed my call. Apparently. Thanks cookies. Uh, from the Raven 200, I don't know how long I have to watch live, so I'll say this now. CTFD Dave, I love hearing you. Seth, your voice is as amazing as your work. Jimmy, go take a buckshot lariat from Hangman Adam Page. I do not understand the last part of that statement, but thank you for the kind words that came before. Love I have it. the interpretation from the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, Raven likes to create every week, likes to create more, likes to offer more creative ways to insult Jimmy. And by insulting Jimmy, tell him how much we love him because Jimmy hates a compliment. So that's oh, what that's about. Clever. Clever. Thank you, Raven. $4.99 from John Doan. Dave and Seth, I have a question about a hashtag I've been using for years. Hashtag desert murder manuals is a good one for the three books, Old Testament and the Quran. So he's, right, what he's calling that? several of the, I guess, the more violent genocidal books of these religions, desert murder manuals. I think it's not far off. Yeah. I mean, okay. It's as valid as Go any of the it. others, I think. Sure. Yeah. I think you could uh, copyright that and, and do well. Thank you, John. Uh, Five dollars from Panda. Nice to have you back, Dave and Seth, too. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Panda. Appreciate it. 
Glad to be back. Four ninety nine <laughs> from Donkey Butt. Seth mentioned benefiting from learning how the brain works and how ideas are formed. What are your best book, article, YouTube, et cetera, recommendations? There you go, Seth. Well, I would I would start you with David McRaney's How Minds Change, because David gets into a lot of identity beliefs and why many of our discussions fail and how often we might go into an exchange being wrong, convinced that we could never be wrong. It's funny, when I came out of religion, I used to think, well, now I'm part of the atheist culture. We're all rationalists here. You know, we don't have a lot of those bad ideas. We're all centered and focused and and we're all data driven. And of course, after eight minutes, I realized that we're all just human and we're all capable of bias and bad ideas and emotion and even toxicity and nastiness. And you know, we're all guilty of being human. We are all human for better and for worse. But I think Dave McRaney does a really good job. I'd start you with his book, How Minds Change. Good recommendation. Thank you, Doc. You uh, New Zealand, is it dollars in New Zealand? They call it something else. By the way, there's a place I've always wanted to visit. I was so close when I went down to Australia. Oh. Matt and Aaron actually went, and I, I still regret it to this day, one day. Uh, from Deepak <laughs> Stevens, thanks both. was great speaking to you both, and I appreciate the kind advice. It's an Thank honor, you, my Deepak. friend. Thank you. Yes, it was Thank indeed. You. Thank you so much. Nine ninety nine from Wanda Larson. Dream team tonight with Dave and Seth. Thanks for a wonderful show. Well, appreciate that. Very kind. Thank, Thank you, Wanda. Nine ninety nine from Brian Poo. What's up with poo and butts and stuff on the deal? It's interesting. It's the is show, it Brian, we do, Seth. Is it Brian Poo. Great show, everyone. Really enjoyed it. Very kind. Thanks. Uh, thanks for watching and listening. Thanks, thanks Poo. <laughs> Five dollars from Trudy. So does thinking I have a spirit put me in the same category as flat earthers? I just think it's a fact of our nature. No God, no afterlife. I don't know. What do you think, Seth? I think you'd have to define spirit. Yeah. You mean like spirit, like a, a soul? You know, then we get into mind-body dualism, right? Is the, is the mind the brain? Or the mind and the brain two different things and i don't think so i think the machine of the mind is pretty much all there is but if you were to say you have have a spirit do you mean a something that is extra natural that cannot be seen or measured is it a soul of some kind and where did that come from and how could you detect it and if you can't detect it how do you verify it i don't know it's you've you've opened yeah. the door to a lot of other questions when it comes to verification that's the problem. It's hard to verify it. It's a matter of just what do you think? And yeah. I mean, you could sit around and speculate on that all day, but you don't come up with a conclusion that's not verified. So, And I'll throw this out as well. And Dr. Julian Mussolino is a neuroscientist who has actually made a great, great point about this in his book called The Soul Fallacy, where people talk about, well, if we have, well, I have a soul, there's, there's me and my brain, and then there's my soul, but you can't measure my soul. It's supernatural, or it's, I always like the word extra natural for those who aren't thinking in terms of religions and superstitions. But he makes the salient point that this is still a scientific question. If the soul does drive my identity, if it drives my thoughts and actions and attitudes and behaviors, then that is a reaction that should be detectable by brain scans. You should be able to see a soul driving my brain. And that has never happened. So, yep. Two cents. Good point. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, is it me? Yeah. Uh, $10. The Raven is back. I'm back. Atmos flat. Seth, that was funny. Glad I never believed flat earth BS. I don't know what to say for Arden. I get, I guess Arden, go aggressively eat delicious food and menacingly have a nice day. It's an odd construction of, I guess, odd assembling of words. Um, is that a compliment for Arden? I, I think so. I'm not sure. I'll take it that way. Okay, we're going to receive that. 
with with uh, with good it's, intent. It, with Raven, it's a compliment disguised as an insult. So <laughs> okay, that's a trend here. Okay, I like that. I like that. Five dollars from Technomancer Megas. Seth, we're trying to channel Rocky with your. <laughs> If I can change and you can change, then maybe we can all change it at the end. That's of right. IV. At the end of Rocky the- four, which is not a good yeah. movie. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone's character of Rocky goes out and he's going to go uh, up against uh, Drago, right? Who was a convenient villain for the time, given it was us versus the Russians. And so he goes out while uh, Drago's in the, in the gym with this high tech equipment, who's able to apparently punch with enough force to punch through a tractor tire, <laughs> which makes no <laughs> sense. And then you got Rocky and he's holding logs on his shoulders and running mountains with no climbing gear and no oxygen. And then they end up in the ring. And somehow in Russia, at the end of this boxing match, everybody starts screaming for Rocky, Rocky, Rocky. And he gives a speech when he beats Drago and he says, Essentially, if if he can change, you can change, I can change, everybody can change. Meaning somehow, I guess we could all be more American. I don't know exactly what we're changing into, but I didn't have that in mind when I said it. But it, it, it now I will think of nothing else when those words come out of my mouth. That's so hysterical. we're now Thank reduced you. to quotes from Rocky IV. On Rocky IV. That's, that's Rocky great, IV. Seth. Thanks for that. Yeah, Not that's a good great. movie. Not a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> New Zealand, I uh, eight dollars and ninety nine New Zealand dollars from Lim, Lemon Peel Angelfish. Hey, it's the Dream Team. We've been called that twice tonight. We should get t shirts or something. Much love to you both. So good to see you, Dave Hart. A massive thank you to the mods and crew. You're awesome. Yes, they do the hard work, and we get the easy part. Truly, thank, thank you, you, Angelfish. Luke Anderson, $5. Happy to hear that Seth goes big on Halloween. I'm building my annual haunted tour as I listen to the show. Have a happy Halloween, everyone. Appreciate you, Luke. Thanks so much. Happy Halloween to you. We ain't afraid of those demons and witches, are we? You know, when I was growing up, it was always this satanic panic oh, going yeah. on. You yeah. know, the, the Satanists are out. So don't let your black cat out. Mom was always checking our candy for poison or razor blades. Uh, we weren't allowed to dress up as like witches or anything like mm-hmm. that. No demons or devils. You know, my we were able to celebrate, but it was very protective. It was kind yeah. of a sheltered kind of a version. So maybe that's part of the reason that I like to go all out is because now yeah. that I don't believe in gods and monsters, now bring on the demons, man. Bring on the witches and the skeletons and the undead. It's awesome. Thanks, Luke. It's you. Yeah, five dollars from Monkey at Typewriter. Seth, I'm pretty thick. When do we get the Seth Andrews, the thick atheists? <laughs> I feel a double entendre is attached it's, it's, to this, and I don't know if I'm projecting or not, but I'm very blushy, so don't make me blush. But uh, no, there will only be uh, there will only be Seth, the you know, the very late to the party, but hopefully occasionally thinking atheist. That's all you got. I hope it's enough. That's good enough, Seth. No. Thanks, Monkey. $10 from Sheridan Bernasconi. Thanks, Sheridan. Great show, guys. Love you both. Appreciate your support and kind words, Cher. Thank you, Sheridan. $20, Ryan P. My grandpa, who I love despite the fact that he donated large sums to the Heritage Foundation, just passed away. My feelings are very mixed. And this show has really helped me sort things out. Family sure is messy, CTFD. Mm. You know, it's, uh, it's hard. Biological family is hard. And I will say that to watch somebody who is caught up in what we consider to be grift, Heritage Foundation, I think, is grift, or yeah. just really bad ideas. We ache to rescue them. We see what they could be, how good life could be without it. And then, you know, we we think, if only. And uh, I understand the angst and the struggles that that, that those circumstances provide. And I'm sorry for the loss in your family. And I'm sorry that, uh, you know, that that mind wasn't changed. But I'm also thankful that you 
have sort of carved your own path out of that and that you are representing a you're living your authentic life being your authentic self as a skeptic and a rationalist and a humanist and i think that's also the story as well you know your grandma's part of the story but i think you are as well yeah thanks ryan for that um for your contribution and your kind words i'm glad the show helped you process some of that you said it right family sure is messy Messy. And it, I, a big reason is because we have so many obligations attached to it and expectations to our normal neighbor or uh, someone on the street. We don't have expectations of that relationship or we don't sense obligations toward them. But family, we do because we're born into this thing. And again, we didn't have any choice in the matter. We didn't choose to whom we'd be born or what kind of family that would look like. And so it does complicate things, but at the end of the day, we get to choose who we spend time with and who we, whose company we value. And I just think it's important to remind ourselves of that, that we don't owe that to anyone other than those that we find that help us along the way, that we help them along the way. But sorry for your loss, Ryan. I appreciate your words. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Four ninety nine from Digital Hammurabi. Hey, good to see you. Thank you for that, Seth and Dave. Best of the best. Any good slavery book recommend recommendations, Seth? Oh my goodness! There's a brand new version of Did the Old Testament Endorse Slavery? Second edition that is written by Doctor Joshua <laughs> Bowen, narrated by Seth Andrews. You can get it in oh, hardcover, paperback, or at Audible.com. What a wonderful project and a great resource if you are engaging in counter apologetics in your own life. How was that, Josh? I feel set up here, but you know, that's okay because we got five bucks. So you <laughs> okay. guys do that all night. I'm fine with it. <laughs> uh, Panda, here's another five. Hope everyone has a great night. Thank you, Panda. Much appreciated. Thank you. And it was good to see Dr. Josh tune in. You do the audio on all his books, correct? Uh, I just, you know, it's, I, I've done the last three. And, you know, people are sometimes asking me, like, well, all you do is read it, right? So if it's, <laughs> you know, and I, I always try to, people have no idea how much time it takes to really narrate an audiobook. You're reading it, and then you read the paragraph again, and then you do five versions of the same sentence and inflect, and then you go back, and then the dog barks, and then you have to leave, and you come back, and you put it together, and you want to edit it, and blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, so they're a challenge, and I've, I've narrated, I think I'm on my 13th right now. Josh's books are five times harder because they're filled with freaking ancient, Babylonian, Sumerian, Hebrew they're words. They're, they're huge. massive. I'm sorry. So I've got him on my text thread, and he and I are buddies. And I'm like, who the fuck? How, how do I how do I say this word? This one that's got <laughs> nine syllables about a king that lived 4,500 years ago. So I will type it in, and then he'll speak it back, and then I'll make a phonetic, and we'll go through it. And uh, it's, I mean, it's really a remarkable process, but it's also a really good feeling to know that, that he is providing resources for those of us who do engage. And a lot of people, Old Testament slavery is one of those things that almost always comes up in debates with apologists. Yeah. We're like, well, yes, it was slavery. And they're like, it was indentured servitude, or it was a different time, or God had to mm -hmm. condescend to the culture, or blah, blah, blah. And uh, all of this stuff spinning around, and Josh manages to sort of cut through that, to lay yeah, things out, to compare the Old Testament laws with other laws in the ancient Near East, to talk about the morality or lack of. And, and so even though it's a tall mountain to climb whenever Josh releases a new book and I get involved, I'm always like, awesome, shit, at the same time. It is an amazing <laughs> project. It is an amazing, and I'm glad to be a part of it. I hear Seth saying, Dr. Josh, slow down, okay, bro? slow down just your next book just 2026 just give the narrator <laughs> a break buddy like he must be well, prolific I, because yeah, he, you know that's is, a lot of material I'm out i yeah i love no, that's really good stuff yeah it is great i i uh, did my own audio on my memoir and that's all i want to do i don't have the voice for it anyway but man it's that hard, was hard. Isn't I, it? I would start doing something a jet would fly over and at the stop and and then the neighbor down the street decided to jackhammer his whole 
driveway out about the time I started. So I had to pick times when the guys were on a break or something. It was just, it was, it was tough. It was tough. I was recording narration for one of the ghost stories and the freaking guy across the street is out front with his weed whacker. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm like, I, I can't even work. I get total first world problems, but I can't, I need to create people. And this man's using his weed whacker. I just can't stand it. So yes, I feel your pain, brother. I feel your pain. Well, bro, thanks for coming on tonight. It's always a pleasure to have you on anything I'm doing. I love coming on your stuff. Uh, what I mean, everybody knows where to find you, but what do you got coming up? Where we find you? What's up with Seth Andrews? Well, on the uh, podcast front, I am um, about to release my 700th show, which for some is not a big number, but it's pretty big for me considering the show's been, the podcast has been going on since the summer of 2010. I've got Drew McCoy from Genetically Modified Skeptic going to join me, and we're just going to talk. I've got Andrew Whitehead, who is a Christian, who has also joined people like you and me to oppose Christian nationalism. I was glad to land him for the show. He's kind of a big fish. He and I are going to talk in, uh, I think, early November. Uh, And, you know, I I think we're all just going to, you know, I'm going to try to keep kicking. I'm going to probably start looking at dates to... uh, you know, as to where we're going to be conventions for 2024, this is the time when they start slotting those in and I'll get those on the website and the calendar and hopefully I'll get a chance to connect with people in, uh, you know, out there on the road. But, uh, I, you know, I just mostly want to say thanks. Thanks for allowing me to play along, Dave. I, I just love you. I appreciate your kindness. You know, the fact that you are, you're strong and you're smart, uh, but you're also really empathetic and kind and, and you, you really try to meet people where they are. And I think that's refreshing and amazing and wonderful. And, and so, uh, you know, to be here and to be friends and to be a part of the show is a real honor for me. Thank you. Well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. You, uh, you're kind of the standard bearer, in my view, uh, with all of this that's going on in the atheist activism world. And, um, you know, I just appreciate all you do and all you've done and the p- people you've helped. And keep doing it, man. Very kind. Thank you, brother. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in again to Dying Out Loud on the line. We appreciate all the super chats, all you guys who called. Uh, Love doing the show, so thank you for being a part of it. We've got, as you know, the the lineup coming up this week. Tomorrow night, uh, the hang-up, I don't know the menu. I'm sorry, I've messed it up. But shows. watch all the the shows on the line because every one of them are good. It's the best channel on the interwebs. So thanks to... Arden, our producer tonight, and the mods in the chats and the call screeners. We appreciate all you guys do in the background. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And we'll close out tonight with um, the list of our patrons scrolling to the right of the screen. Also, thanks to Candace Planet, who sent a super chat at the last possible second. Oh, <laughs> I'm so Candace. grateful for y'all in this community of skeptical humanists generally. What you do, carpe the fucking DM. Thanks, Candace. That's it. Good night, everyone.